things over to our first presenter, uh, Dr. Sanjeev uh, Suratwala, who will begin with a discussion of the natural history of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, so if we could let Sanjeev have the mouse, all yours. Hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to this first uh, inaugural seminar uh, or webinar on scoliosis uh, through the Scoliosis Research Society. Um, here are the disclosures of all the speakers. So the first talk today is going to be on a natural history of scoliosis, what to expect if you have idiopathic scoliosis. As uh, you might be aware, a diagnosis of scoliosis can cause a lot of anxiety and stress. Um, there is a lot of abundant information available online um, everywhere you turn. Uh, over the internet, there is um, free uh, information available. You just have to know your source. So as a exercise, I always try and do a Google search on the topic uh, that we're presenting. And I tried to do that for this um, talk today. And when I put, just put in scoliosis in Google, and this is where I am, it came up with, uh, I believe, 7 million results in 0.53 seconds. So that's certainly a lot of information. It would take you several lifetimes to go through all these uh, results. Um, so it's, it's important to, to figure out where you're getting the information for, from. Um, by way of introduction of the society, the Scoliosis Research Society was founded in 1966, so almost 50, over 50 years ago. And it's an international society focused on treatment of spinal deformity, uh, including scoliosis, increased kyphosis. Uh, members of this society include over a thousand of the world's leading spine surgeons, researchers, physician assistants, and orthotists, um, and other clinicians. And it's committed to research and education of clinicians and patients. So you can go online and um, try and look up the webpage um, later, but it's www.srs.org. And this is a screenshot of what that uh, landing page looks like. And it, it constantly evolves. So this is the most uh, current version of it. And there are different sections on patients, um, prof for professionals, and just a, a history of the school, uh, SRS on here. Um, these are some of the handbooks that have been put out by the society over the years. And uh, this is a recent handbook on uh, a general uh, handbook on spinal deformity for scoliosis and kyphosis. Um, these may be available through your uh, treating physician's office. Uh, copies of this are available in PDF format online as well for you to download. And a lot of the information that I, I am talking about today is actually directly through the website and through some of these brochures. So you can get a sense of what's actually already available um, on the website. Um, so for the rest of the talk, um, I'll start off with just the definitions used in the talk today just to get everybody on the same page. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the natural, natural history or what to expect when you have scoliosis, followed by my uh, colleagues who will talk a little bit about bracing and then alternative non-operative treatments. Uh, subsequently, we'll have a question and answer sh session as well. Um, so the, the first definition really is what is scoliosis? And uh, people kind of try and interpret it as a curvature of the spine in different directions, but uh, Technically, it is a, a condition of a side-to-side -side curve that's shown in this diagram that measures then more than 10 degrees. So th this is a, a curve that's um, always measured. And knowing your numbers is helpful because uh, a lot of treatments are based on, on, on these numbers. Um, and um, the external appearance may be uh, unevenness of the shoulders or hip. Uh, so that may be the first sign that uh, somebody has scoliosis, and that may be the first thing that's noticed by uh, parents or caregivers, uh, or even the, the patient themselves. Um, on an x-ray, if you go for an evaluation, um, this is what a, a typical scoliosis curve may look like. Uh, it, it, the spine looks, if you're looking from the front, instead of looking straight up and down, uh, the spine looks more like an S or a C, uh, like in this case. Uh, and you can see uh, one of my colleagues has done an excellent job of measuring out these, these curves. So there's an angle at the top, which is 27 degrees. Bottom, at the middle is 53 and 26. So as you can imagine, the 53 is a, a fairly big number compared to the others. And uh, a lot of the treatments will be focused on, on um, treating that number and, and uh, 
following the progression of that number. Um, what is adolescent idiopathic scoliosis? So that's something that's uh, commonly thrown around, and it's more of a technical term, but if you break it down, the adolescent means in the teenage population, um, and this is typically uh, in the preteens and the teenagers before um, the bones become mature. And it's much more common in girls than boys. And this is um, by far the most common condition of scoliosis that, uh, that we see as treating physicians. Uh, in that definition, we have the term, or in that, term, uh, in that phrase, we also have the term idiopathic. Uh, and technically, it means that we don't really know the cause. Um, a lot of patients have the question of, you know, how did I get scoliosis? There's nobody in my family who has scoliosis. And um, the vast majority of people actually show up incidentally. These conditions do sometimes run in families, um, but the vast majority of patients are, are de novo, meaning that they really have no prior history of, of scoliosis in the family. Uh, and, and these are 85% of cases of scoliosis typically seen. Um, so what are the signs of scoliosis? If you're just looking at the person, um, typically they're inspected or evaluated from the back, uh, where you can see the, the anatomy a little more clearly with the shoulders and the hips. So one shoulder may be higher than the other. Um, one shoulder blade may be more noticeable, so that's something that's also uh, seen often. Uh, and sometimes the arms uh, may be different, so if you're wearing a shirt, the sleeves may, be, may appear uneven. Uh, one hip may be higher than the other, so this is seen in the wearing the pants. One leg, pant leg may rise up versus the other. Uh, and the head also may be shifted a little bit, so you're not standing straight, even though you think you are, or you may be trying to. And on bending forward, one side of the back may be higher than the other. Um, no current known cause of idiopathic scoliosis. That's why it's called idiopathic. We really don't know uh, what the reason for this is. Um, frequently, it does run in families, and there may be a genetic component, and there's a lot of research ongoing on uh, trying to identify these genes. Um, there are some other forms of scoliosis that do we do know why they occur, and uh, uh, the other two types that we do know a lot about is congenital scoliosis, which is due to defects in vertebrae, uh, and this typically presents much earlier in a younger population. And then neuromuscular scoliosis, which may be due to neurologic or muscular conditions <coughs> that uh, people might have. Um, so how is it diagnosed? Uh, typically, it's diagnosed on a physical exam uh, and x-rays. That's really the, the gold standard of, of diagnosing this, and MRI may occasionally be needed if there is something abnormal about the x-ray. So this is what the, a person might look like with scoliosis. As you can see the shoulders are a little bit uneven, the shoulder blade is sticking out more than the other side, and even the waist, this side has a deeper crease, and this one's a little straighter. And you can see, again, the head is slightly off uh, towards the left. Um, this is a side view, and you may not see much on the side view. And this is the same person bending forward, and you can see how one shoulder blade sticks out compared is higher than the other. Um, this is that person's x-rays, and you can see how the middle part of the curve is, is the biggest part of this curve. Uh, and, and if you have a diagnostic scoliosis, sometimes additional x-rays are done where uh, you're made to bend side to side, and that's to see how flexible the curve is. So if you bend uh, to where the arrow is pointing towards the left on the image, you can see the bottom curve essentially straightens out to four degrees from 20-something. And then this is what it looks like looking straight on. And on the other, this is if you bend to the right, and you can see how the middle curve goes from 57-something to 18 degrees. So this is a fairly flexible spine. You can see how much correction you can get just by bending side to side. So this is in an earlier teenage pop person whose bones may not be um, uh, mature yet, and, and there is still some, a lot of flexibility in the spine. So what if you have a diagnosis of um, idiopathic scoliosis? Uh, well, 90% of cases are mild and actually do not require active treatment, so these are just followed and to make sure that it's not getting worse. However, it's probably a good idea to see somebody who specializes in scoliosis or treats it um, actively to make sure that um, if, you are in the, if you are going through a growth spur in the early teenage years where there is a potential for this to worsen, that you don't miss a chance to treat it early on and prevent a, a much bigger curve later on. Um, occasionally, the repeat physical exam and x-rays may be needed. And if there is a change in curve, you may need bracing and, and occasionally surgery if there is a significant progression of the curve. So what do we know about um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis? That's the main part of this uh, with the natural history. And the bottom line is we look at the scientific evidence. So 
Um, this is one of the scientific journals uh, from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Um, and this was a, um, this is a long-term study um, by one of uh, prominent surgeons in scoliosis uh, looking at what is the evidence for, for the prognosis and treatment of adolescent hepatic scoliosis. Um, so, uh, you know, to, to kind of summarize this, the scoliosis, the lateral curve more than 10 degrees, um, over 500,000 adolescents younger than 16 have AIS. So again, you may not be alone uh, with this diagnosis of scoliosis. And treatment us usually recommended curve is over 20 degrees. So that's why, again, those numbers become important. Um, what, so what happens with the natural history if, if scoliosis is not treated? One of the earlier studies, so way back before modern medicine technically came around, in 1968 there were a few studies from Scandinavia and um, they, they report on long-term outcomes of scoliosis and if people have been around from back then, um, they, it created a major scare uh, among patients and uh, the sort of misinformation created anxiety among patients and families because they report on increased death, chronic low back pain, and heart and lung problems. And that sort of stuck uh, in a lot of patients' minds that scoliosis is this horrible condition that can cause significant life problems and, and potentially death and heart and lung issues. Um, Concurrently in the U.S. Um, to the University of Iowa, Iowa, which has a fairly stable population, people don't seem to migrate out of Iowa very much, the university there was able to actually follow um, patients uh, and families over time. So we have an extensive history of, of scoliosis through this particular uh, area. And from the 1990s, there were reports of 50 plus year follow-up of patients who were not really treated for scoliosis. So this is really what gives us a lot of information on what happens to people who don't get treated. Um, and these were patients that were followed from their teenage years throughout their life. An average age was 66 years at follow-up, so you know, about 50 years of follow-up. And they actually commented, that they found that there was no increase in the death rate. So people seem to have a normal life without dying early. Um, there were no severe lung problems if scoliosis began in the teenage years. Um, it's it seemed a little more commonly if it's very early on in, in early childhood, but in the teenagers, it's not as big a deal. Um, if the curve decreases, if the curve is greater than 50 degrees, they found that there was some decrease in the pulmonary function. And if there was greater than 80 degrees in thoracic spine, that led to much higher shortness spread. So again, these numbers are very important. And, and in the U.S., these is rarely does anybody get into the 80 degree curve. I mean, most people are caught early and treated to prevent that sort of high curve. Um, in, in this study, there was some progression of the curve, meaning over 68, so 68, the, the majority of people did have the curves that worsened over time. And if the curve was actually less than 30 degrees at skeletal maturity, meaning when people matured uh, around 17, by 17, 18 years, uh, it did not progress much. Um, if the curve was between 50 and 70 degrees, uh, that seemed to have progressed the most. As you can imagine, the bigger the curve, the faster it's going to get worse. Um, and if those occur both in the upper and lower part of your spine. They tend to balance with age and, and maintain the alignment. So it did get a little bit worse, but this seemed to have a little bit more of a favorable prognosis. Um, so the other common thing that people ask about is back pain. Does scoliosis cause back pain? Um, there was um, more chronic back pain in these patients that were untreated, and uh, they seemed to have more episodes of back pain it seemed to last a little bit longer, but it did not seem to affect their jobs or household activities and did not appear to have a higher level of disability. Um, the, the biggest concern really was cosmetic, cosmetic concern, that they seemed like they, they weren't straight and, and some people were more self-aware that they had a, a curved spine uh, and they didn't stand straight. Um, so a third of people did report some life limitation when purchasing clothes and they were self-conscious and decreased physical activity. And they seemed to function well as adults. They were employed, married, had children, and they were fairly active as older adults into their 60s. So fa what factors determine treatment? So I, I kept mentioning the, the curve. So that's probably one of the most significant factors that have, uh, determines treatment. So and, and my colleagues will elaborate that further. Um, but age and years is important. So the earlier you're diagnosed with scoliosis, um, the more likely you're going to require treatment. Um, bone age is important. Uh, so if you're, again, if you're skeletally young and immature, your, your curve may tend to progress a little bit faster and, and have a more, more of a tendency to progress. 
and the degree of curvature, which I mentioned multiple times, and the location of the curve in the spine, so something that in, in, there was in the thoracic or upper back seemed to progress more. Um, status of puberty, so if, if for women, if um, if you had your period, uh, if you were before, if you did not have your period when you were diagnosed with scoliosis, then you had a higher chance of progression versus somebody who was diagnosed with scoliosis later on in their teenage years. Uh, again, women tend to have a higher tendency to progress with their curvature, and and your own curve progression. So if you go for uh, uh, multiple follow-ups, you go see your doctor in six months, a year, and your curve seems to be progressing or getting worse from 20 to 30 to 40, obviously that um, means that your curve is not stable and, and may need uh, additional treatments, including bracing or, or even surgery. So I'll stop here and then pass it off to my colleague, Dr. Goodwin, to continue the talk. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much, Sanjeev. Hopefully can hear me, it looks like the mouse got passed over. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, greetings from sunny Cleveland, Ohio, and my charge is to talk about uh, bracing treatment for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Let's see if I can advance the slide, perfect. Um, so I'll start a little bit uh, more about history of bracing and how it got started, uh, and then what exactly modern bracing is, which patients need it, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more um, about evidence and do we have evidence, does it really work? And hopefully wrap it up at the end with some bullet points that will you can take home uh, and hopefully have some good information moving forward. Um, his, bracing is probably the most well-studied and successful non-surgical treatment for scoliosis. And it really dates back all the way to Hippocrates, um, the 5th century BC. And he, he came up with this table he called a scamnum. And you can see this cartoon drawing of him this poor patient strapped to this rack looking device. Um, as you can imagine, it didn't work very well, but the initial idea for bracing sort of came from this. Um, and then uh, moving forward to the 1500s, a French physician, Paré, was really the first to apply a corset to a children who had horrible spine deformities. And he made them out of iron, and they, were, they had holes perforated in them. And it turns out that really didn't work well either. But again, the concept was there. It wasn't until Dr. Hibbs in the early 1900s came up with this concept of a turnbuckle cast, which you see this, again, a cartoon drawing here, a person who was placed basically in a body cast, which was cut, and then some sort of a, a distracting device was put on the side to change the alignment of the patient's trunk. And they had some limited success in prevention with these. Uh, moving forward into more modern era, uh, the, from casting, the, the Milwaukee brace is probably the the first real workhorse removable orthosis or brace uh, that was used to treat scoliosis. Uh, you, you may see, see the term CTLSO, which stands for cervical thoracic lumbar sacral orthosis. Um, initially, this brace was developed for post-operative care, uh, but it turns out it turned out to be fairly uh, good for primary treatment of progressive curves, and it really served as a major advance, again, because it was a removable device. And it really opened the door for more modern uh, braces. Uh, the Wellington brace was developed in the late 60s, uh, basically out of necessity from a cast. Um, basically, a patient couldn't tolerate the cast, so they basically took a mold out of a cast uh, and made a removable brace. And about the same time uh, was the genesis of the Boston brace. Uh, and the Boston brace, it, it really revolutionized our brace treatment and it's sort of, it's still the gold standard for what we use today. Uh, it basically, from measurements made on the individual patient, there's a series of semi-custom molds and this brace can be put together for any given patient in their specific deformity. And this brace really is the first to provide a corrective force to the patient. Um, uh, the Boston brace had some good success, and uh, along came some nighttime braces, too, for patients who either couldn't tolerate the brace wear schedule or uh, the theory that the curves may progress a lot at nighttime as the patients were growing. If you could provide a corrective force while the patient was sleeping, that might also be good. So the Charleston and Providence braces were developed, and they, the, Charleston is sort of the one on the, on the right side of the slide over here. If I can get my arrow over. There it is. Uh, and the provenance is here on the left. And what they do is they, instead of provide 
forces uh, on the ribs and trunk like the Boston does while the patient is upright. These actually overbend and overcorrect the spine while the patient's sleeping. Um, perhaps compliance is better, uh, but this is also a brace that is used with some frequency uh, in 2017. Um, so that's a brief history of bracing for scoliosis. Now what can we expect a bracer to actually do for the patient? And I think it's important to understand this, that braces are designed and what we, they can actually do is, is slow down or prevent progression of the deformity during a period of growth. And hopefully uh, prevent the need for any operations. Um, so hopefully it would ultimately stop progression for a lifetime. A brace will not, we know, will not produce a lasting correction. Uh, it can make some x-rays look better temporarily as we'll see a little further in this talk and maybe you've experienced this yourself. But once the brace treatment uh, is completed, it will no longer, the, the x-ray usually settles back to the, the numbers, those all important numbers uh, that um, they start with. So in 2017, who needs a brace? Uh, again, it's important. A brace will only, can only be effective if there is growth remaining. So a patient has to have growth remaining for this to work to sort of guide growth. Typically, uh, at the latest within one year of menses, uh, some surgeons may suggest earlier than that, but I think the SRS bracing criteria has been fairly well laid out and uh, a lot of us in our group follow these. Um, and they're laid out fairly nicely. If you've got a curve, again, going back to the numbers, uh, greater than 30 degrees at initial presentation, that's not greater than 40, or uh, in my mind, greater than 25 degrees with documented progression because most of these patients do not start curved. Uh, so we gotta have at least 25 degrees for a brace, to, brace treatment to be uh, helpful. And again, the goal of bracing is maintenance of the current curve or slowing the progression through growth. And it's important to understand uh, as treating physicians and as patients and family members that the bracing does not improve the curve permanently. Again, only helps to guide growth. So if you think of it as a device that can help guide growth, that's a good way to think about it. All right. Maybe it's not advancing now. Let's try again. Uh, I'm going too far. So, this is a similar slide on who might need a brace. So the, the x-ray on the left of your screen here is a patient with a fairly severe curvature uh, that is someone who's a candidate for an operation for their curves, too big for a brace. The patient on the right um, has a very, very mild curvature, uh, therefore they're not severe enough to consider a brace. And this one in the middle um, is still someone who's growing and their skeleton is not yet mature and has a curve that is mild to moderate enough to, to fit in and be nicely treated with a brace. Uh, what brace types are there? Well, I've, I've spoken about these already. The, the sort of the gold standard is the Boston brace we see here on the left, or the nighttime variants here on the right, the Charleston and the uh, Providence type braces. And the wear schedule um, is very uh, physician dependent or provider dependent. Compliance can be challenging. Some kids roll with a brace very nicely and some it can really upset household harmony, so compliance can be a challenge. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about brace wear schedule in a minute. This is just an example picture of a young lady wearing a Boston style brace. You can see her on the left from the front. She's very happy to be wearing her brace and here from the side. The middle picture is an x-ray before the brace and the one on the right is an x-ray in the brace. You can see the buckles here on the x-ray and show that it's, it's while the patient is wearing the brace the spine has a corrected position. Here's a sort of a picture of a nighttime bending brace. These, I think, are a bit better for the lumbar curves, you can, or thoracal lumbar curves. So you can see the patient on the left has a lower curvature, and here she is in her brace, and this curvature is nicely, you know, maintained in this corrected position while she's wearing the brace. Again, you can see the buckles here. Um, and then moving on, so what is the evidence? Does this really work? Um, and there have been many studies in our medical journals on various uh, braces uh, showing a positive treatment effect, that they can slow the progression of curves and they can delay or even prevent surgery uh, or prevent progressive curves. I will we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this study, the brace study. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013, because I think it's really the best evidence that we have on bracing. The study started out as a comparison. They compared patients who were 
uh, being braced to patients who were just only observed and not braced. And they actually employed um, some heat sensors to monitor the time in the brace. So patients didn't know this, so they recorded whether or not the patients actually wore their brace. And they largely used the Boston brace for this. And they actually stopped the observation group because the bracing treatment was clearly better than observation alone. So they defined successful treatment as if they could avoid surgery or get to a curve that was about 50 degrees, which is an indication for surgery. Um, and the brace group was 75% successful in all comers, um, better than just under 50% for the observation group. And again, these are all patients who fit the criteria for bracing. Um, an interesting number here is that one of the statistical measures we use in medicine to measure studies is the number needed to treat when there's an intervention. So using this intervention, we only need three there were only three cases needed to treat to prevent one case of someone progressing beyond 50 degrees. So I thought that that's a very powerful number uh, and good evidence to show that bracing is indeed, does indeed have a positive treatment effect. Uh, they also were able to look in the study about the dose response because it's a question of, you know, how much do you have to wear this thing? Do you, can you wear it for two hours a day? Do you have to wear it 23 hours a day? Um, and the heat centers in the study were very helpful. They basically showed that if you wore the brace six hours or less, it was basically the same as not wearing it at all. So there was no treatment benefit if you only wore it between zero and six hours. Patients who wore the brace over 13 hours a day, it was 90 to 93% effective at preventing uh, the ultimate you know, the progression to surgery. So again, very powerful. So brace wear clearly in the study shows uh, a dose response. And this study really is the most comprehensive and highest level of evidence that we have for specifically for TLSO, thoracal lumbar sacral orthosis bracing for scoliosis. Uh, and it, there, the recommendations were that bracing does indeed work and it does seem to be dose dependent. So more hours per day equals better likelihood of success. Um, so to wrap all of this up, uh, bracing does seem to be a very effective treatment. It is an effective treatment for AIS. Um, and again, important to remember that bracing can only slow or prevent the progression. It doesn't correct the spinal alignment. And only select patients or candidates. So patients have to have growth remaining. It is a, it is a growth guiding modality. Really, these are curves between 20 and 40 degrees with growth remaining. And the wear schedule matters. So it seems that clearly if you can, the patients can wear the brace 13 or more hours per day, it's most effective. And it's certainly better than observation alone to help prevent progression and avoid surgery. And then with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Lee. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and uh, greetings from Connecticut. Um, my task is to talk to everyone about alternative non-operative treatments for scoliosis, essentially to figure out what we know and what we don't know about these particular treatments. So. First, to begin the uh, discussion, we really need to know what is out there. What are the alternative treatments for scoliosis? And a quick internet search uh, reveals literally hundreds of options. And they range from chiropractic care to color therapy, uh, holistic medicine, magnetic therapy, uh, even yoga. And the goal here is to kind of figure out what treatment options really have some scientific basis um, for managing scoliosis and what has stood the test of time. Well. Let's see, having a little trouble moving the next slide. Okay, so techniques that have um, failed the test of time, uh, we know the rack, and uh, this, is, uh, this was offered previously, and this is where your arms and legs are tied to rollers, and a bunch of burly men essentially kind of stretch it out. Um, surprisingly, there were no level one studies to uh, confirm or refute the effectiveness of this, but uniformly nowadays, uh, for most physicians, we believe this to be unsuccessful and quite painful. Um, interestingly, we use a variation of this in surgery, but that's, uh, that's a topic for uh, another talk. Other techniques that have uh, failed the test of time, um, herbal medicine really has not shown uh, kinda, uh, to have any particular effect on scoliosis, despite a focus on rebalancing the chi, the yin, or the yang. Um, homeopathic medicine has no scientific support for managing scoliosis. Uh, the idea of homeopathic medicine is like cures like. 
and diluted natural remedies are placed in water or alcohol. And uh, the problem basically is that the dilutions are so extreme that the effectiveness of the agent is often questionable. Other techniques that have failed the test of time is surface electrical stimulation. Um, in this, uh, electrodes are attached to the skin on the convexity of the curves, and the muscles on those sides are stimulated. And several studies have demonstrated no specific effect on scoliosis uh, progression or maintenance. Um, so this particular technique has no particular effect and is often quite painful. So in looking at all these options, um, we start uh, realizing that most options have really little to no supportive scientific evidence. And instead of going through all the options, I uh, will focus on what is the most popular worldwide. And we start um, thinking about this, we start seeing a global ideological divide in treatment for scoliosis. Um, it turns out that North America, uh, Australia, and the UK are really part of the wait and see group. Essentially, a child comes with a small curve, and you wait and observe, and if the curve gets bigger, then you'll brace, and then you'll watch, and if the curve gets bigger, uh, you'll perform a surgery. Our friends in Europe have a, a slightly different approach. Uh, they use alternative therapies as a um, very uh, as uh, essentially a uh, substitute or an adjunct to the um, uh, typical conservative uh, to the typical standard management that we have, um, and the most popular of these alternative therapies are manual therapies, and these include chiropractic care as well as the Schroff method, spine-specific physiotherapies. Now we should look at the effectiveness of both of these methods and kind of see if there is any uh, particular scientific rigor behind these. So let's look at chiropractic care. Chiropractic care is apparently very commonly selected as a treatment option both in Europe and the United States. In fact, in um, examining uh, uh, the adults who use chiropractic care in 2015, um, about 41% of adults used it for management of low back pain in the United States. The chiropractic board itself in 2000 noted that 3 million scoliosis patients in the U.S. self-selected chiropractic care annually. So that's a lot of people. The basis of chiropractic care is this idea of subluxation or malalignment of the vertebral bodies. The vertebral bodies are subluxated, poorly aligned, and this leads to all sorts of end organ problems such as back pain and even obesity and joint pain. So the goal of chiropractic care is really to kind of realign all these vertebral elements. The typical schedule is usually initial evaluation with radiographs and then serial sessions for manipulation and then a possible diet adjunct. So the question is, does this work? Well, it is typically not accepted as a standard of care for scoliosis. And really the success stories in medicine really exist as isolated case reports. In most larger well-designed studies, it has been shown to have no specific effect. So chiropractic care um, overall has no scientific basis for management of scoliosis. How about the Schroff method? So the Schroff method was developed by Katharina Schroff in 1920, uh, and multiple refinements have occurred subsequently. Um, the entire goal is first to um, uh, reorganize how the body is viewed, and the Schroff method divides the body into these blocks. It is a shoulder block, a thoracic block, a lumbar block, and a hip pelvic block, and it visualizes scoliosis as a deformation of these blocks into essentially trapezoids. The exercises and subsequent postural training, as well as the exercise programs, really aim to uh, or recreate these trapezoids into blocks and realign all these blocks. So how is this different than physical therapy? Well, um, very specifically, uh, the Schroth method uses spine-specific exercises. And what do we mean by this? Well, the girl on the far left is sitting on an exercise ball and is in front of a mirror uh, using uh, what's called a wall bar. And she holds on to these and performs active three-dimensional auto self-correction uh, while observing herself. And this is supposed to correct the three-dimensional deformity of the scoliosis. The girl in the center panel has, uh, is undergoing a lumbar mobilization and curve flexibility exercises. And the girl in the far right panel has uh, what is called a Schroth sail exercise, where she stands with two poles and holds on and performs active stabilization. The red circle represents the concavity, or what's known as the weak side, um, according to Schroth. And during this active stabilization, the patient tries to 
essentially breathe into that left concave side to uh, uh, expand that left lung. So, you know, the, the big question is, does this work? Does it work? Well, um, I think the answer will be maybe. And the best randomized control trial, the best study that I could find on this particular issue is by Monticone. It's out of a group uh, from Italy in 2014. And they looked at essentially 110 patients and randomized them to Schroth versus physical therapy. And all these patients were young, and all these patients had very small curves, essentially less than 25 degrees below a typical bracing range. And what they showed um, after following these patients' maturity was that the patients who received Schroth had Cobb angles that were on average about five degrees less than the physical therapy group, and those patients who received Schroth were a little bit less likely to progress. Um, the problem with the study is that of the 110 patients, not a single patient went on to bracing or needed surgery, which is um, you know, kind of a little bit remarkable. Um, another randomized control trial from Schreiber, uh, looking at a, a smaller group of 45 patients, essentially randomizing them to Schroth plus standard of care, which is like bracing plus observation, or just standard of care, so that the patients who received Schroth at six months after instituting the treatment had improved self-image and quality of life. This particular study didn't look at whether or not the curve was corrected. It just looked at, are you feeling better, and uh, do you kind of think you'll look better? Um, Weiss is the seminal study, and this is from the German Institute um, that uh, has been doing Schroth for decades, essentially. And it's a prospective study of 181 young scoliosis patients treated with Schroth. And the result was, surprisingly, that not a single one progressed um, beyond 25 degrees, so, which is uh, kind of pretty surprising. In 2012, the Cochrane Review looked at the available data at that time to see if uh, the Schroth method uh, was uh, useful for scoliosis management and concluded that there is insufficient evidence. And going forward, I don't think we've seen um, much more additional data suggesting that it uh, truly is uh, beneficial for correcting or replacing um, brace treatment. So, you know, should you use spine-specific therapy to replace bracing? I get this quite a bit. Um, and parents will often come and ask, you know, I really do not like bracing. I do not like the idea of bracing. I've had horrible experiences with bracing when I was a child for scoliosis. Um, should I use this as an alternative? Uh, well, you know, there are several pros and cons to this, and you can really look at it from this particular perspective. Um, on the pro side, there is a small, uh, there is a positive study for smaller curves, so using it for smaller curves might be okay. Um, there is really no morbidity except curve progression. Um, the Schroth method has no particular downside. There are no medication side effects. There is uh, kind of nothing that can really harm you, per se. And then becoming an active participant in the treatment often has beneficial effects for overall compliance with the treatment program, and that may be beneficial for managing scoliosis, uh, whatever the treatment option. The cons are pretty glaring, however. You know, the studies that we have are generally of poor quality. They're either small numbers, uh, short follow-up, or the um, effect size how much it changes the spine is really, really small. There are certain studies that show a two degree change in overall scoliosis, which is well within measurement error. So bracing also has a very clear proven track record as uh, kind of noted by Ryan. In addition, the Schroth method really is a um, investment of time and money. You really have to go through a lot of uh, kind of therapy sessions um, uh, and in, in a busy kind of US schedule, uh, and that might not be the easiest thing to do. Um, I think the uh, uh, most glaring con is that there really is no good study comparing brace to Schroth in preventing surgery, and that is the name of the game. Will this particular intervention prevent me from needing surgery? Will it prevent the curve from progressing to a point where it will continue to progress into adulthood? So if the Schroth method is used, if you select it, um, we believe you should really use it as an adjunct to bracing until further evidence is available. Now, thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Kevin Neal. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. That was excellent. So uh, we have a few uh, questions from our participants that have uh, come in. Um, to our participants, if you have anything that you'd like to ask our speakers, uh, please use the uh, question section on the uh, GoToWebinar uh, app. Uh, and I'd like to introduce uh, Michelle Marks, who's helping me uh, organize the questions. Uh, from San Diego. So, Michelle, 
Uh, do we have a uh, question for one of our uh, speakers? Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Okay, great. Yes. yes, Kevin, we do. We have some great questions from our participants. And um, I'm going to uh, direct the first ones um, to Ryan um, with regards to three-dimensional braces, such as Chanot-style braces. Um, Ryan, can you give your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so there, I, I didn't touch on them uh, in my bracing talk largely because the, the evidence, again, is not quite uh, you know, sufficient as much, to, that we, so we don't know as much about them um, in long-term studies. Uh, there are lots of different ones. Rigo is out there. Uh, there's lots to name a few, and I think um, it's, it's a, it can be a slippery slope sometimes because we, we just don't know as much. You know, the Boston brace is tried and true. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence on Providence as well. Uh, these, I think, more work could be done. And I think the concept of three-dimensional bracing kind of makes a little bit of sense because the deformities, you know, is three-dimensional. Um, but we just don't have enough evidence to um, to say, yes, this is better than Boston. You should switch gears and do this. So hopefully in the future we'll have some more information. Okay, great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, this next question is, um, I believe, directed towards Mark. Mark, we have a participant who's um, interested in knowing more about our thoughts on nutritional deficiencies and how that might be considered a key factor and how supplementations might be used as a part of a treatment protocol. Well, um, so nutritional deficiencies have really never been shown to um, uh, kind of increase the rate of scoliosis. We believe, you know, there have been many theories advanced on the etiology of scoliosis, and looking at the incidence in kind of the U.S. and even third world countries, they're about the same. So we believe a kind of nutritional supplementation probably doesn't play much of a role. Um, vitamin D has gotten uh, a lot of press recently, and we know that about 20% of pediatric orthopedic patients are deficient in vitamin D. We still don't know what that implies for scoliosis or for fracture healing or care in general. So, uh, you know, at this point, I, I uh, can't offer any recommendations for nutritional supplementation. Okay, thank you. Um, back to Ryan, another um, bracing question. Um, and I know you touched a little bit on, no, I'm sorry, this was Mark. I touched a little bit about Schroth, but has, I guess it's a question for both of you. Have there been any studies combining both bracing and Schroth and the effect of using that as a combination? Now, I'll, I'll start. And I, again, I don't know of any specifically that, that are addressing both at the same time. And my, my typical recommendation for my patients who are interested in Schroth is that I, I tell them, just like Mark said, to use, and use it as an adjunct to bracing. Um, and uh, again, it's not harmful. We just don't know. Uh, there's not enough good evidence there that suggests, yes, this is something that can be used in a patient who is, has a curve that's at risk for progression to delay or avoid an operation. We don't know that yet. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to add to kind of Ryan's statement. There really isn't good evidence. The only study that combines the two is the one from Schreiber that we talked about from 2015, and that was the one with the 45 patients that were split into two groups. And one group, uh, both groups had the standard of care, which meant bracing or observation. And about 75% of patients in both groups were braced. Um, and then, uh, but they looked just at the endpoints of like self-image and quality of life. You know, the group promises to have data on uh, curve size in the future, but uh, I think we're still waiting for that to uh, come out. Okay, thank you. We have another participant who's um, uh, additionally interested in bracing, and it has a, a child with no pain now, but, but wondering what the side effects of bracing could be and what she might expect um, and what issues could potentially develop during bracing or after bracing. Oh, I'll chime in on that one. Um, so typically, you know, typically most children who are young, young ladies, or I say young ladies because most patients are, are you know, uh, teenage girls, um, they have no pain going in. And bracing, typically, when someone starts a brace, uh, everybody's different. Uh, but most patients can expect a little bit of a break-in period for the first few weeks they have the brace. They get used to wearing it. Um, they, they maybe start with a lighter wear schedule. Some people have some discomfort when they use it, and you know, some it's very challenging to keep it on. But the vast majority, there's a small break-in period, and then they usually end up being fairly comfortable after a few weeks, and it becomes a second nature to them and their family. Um, once they've got to their max brace wear schedule. 
Okay, thanks. Um, there's <clears throat> there's one that I think um, could be directed towards Sanjeev, and it's a, a participant who's interested in knowing if you believe curves greater than 50 degrees at maturity have a tendency to worsen over time. Well, um, again, there's a little bit of a caveat to that. Uh, I mentioned in the talk that the curves in the thoracic spine, which is in the upper spine, tend to have a higher degree of progression. Um, so it depends on the location. Um, but the bigger the number, especially over 50 degrees, I mean, that's typically the, the number we start thinking about surgical correction because of the high risk of progression. So if you're a teenager with a 50 degree curve, it's certainly highly likely that it's going to progress and, and will eventually need surgery to prevent um, other potential problems from it. Thanks, Sanji. This is Kevin. We have another question about uh, natural history, and one of our participants is wondering if there's any evidence that hormonal uh, imbalances are a factor in scoliosis. Uh, I, again, I'll echo some of uh, Mark's talks uh, earlier that um, you know the there is a tendency for um, to to have a higher incidence in in women, so there is potentially a, a role for that. But I don't think there's any scientific evidence that has shown one way or the other. So uh, you know, obviously, if you have some metabolic disorder or some hormonal abnormality that's objectively um, identified on your blood tests or you know speaking with your physicians, I mean, obviously, you would correct that, but in terms of trying to um, treat scoliosis with any kind of hormonal replacement or therapy, I don't think that's that has any scientific basis at this time. Great. And oh, along those lines, we have some participants that are asking about the uh, genetic testing that's been available in the past for scoliosis. Would you like to comment on that? Well, that's an area of active research, and you know, I. Um, there, there are some companies out there, and, uh, and a lot of research has gone into it. But the, the biggest uh, <clears throat> thing that the genetic testing is trying to evaluate is uh, to, to de determine a prognosis. So the goal of a lot of these, uh, uh, the research has been to determine if uh, specific genes, um, if they are identified in, in a person, will put them at a high risk of curve progression. Um, but it's still fairly early on, and it's not standard at the moment. Uh, maybe uh, There may be a geographic uh, variation as well in that sort of thing. So maybe um, people in Cleveland or Connecticut or, or in Florida may have a different uh, um, uh, opinion on that. No, I, uh, I uh, concur with that opinion. I think uh, perhaps for uh, Ryan, not surprisingly, we have some people that are uh, concerned about requiring multiple x-rays during the course of uh, scoliosis treatment. Um, could you uh, comment on uh, the amount of radiation exposure that typical scoliosis patients get? Yeah, certainly. So if someone is undergoing brace treatment, uh, that's pr someone during their brace treatment is probably going to have to be exposed to the most, the highest frequency of, of x-rays. And again, it it's, it's usually depends on the you know, the treating physicians, you know, their opinion or how often they like to get x-rays. It's typically, you know, a single film, a single scoliosis film once every four to six months, I would say is probably about an average. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, it's not, the amount of radiation is not exceptionally high. And many centers have um, low radiation, uh, low emissions uh, systems that can actually cap capture the image with very minimal radiation, so the EO system. Uh, so if that's the case, then those are the, the the radiation there is almost negligible. But for patients who have standard X-rays, uh, it's really uh, the amount of radiation that you're having at this at that age in uh, the patient's lifetime is really well below what is considered harmful. Uh, so it's really not a, a, a huge worry. Uh, the the treatment. The treatment effect of knowing if the brace is working and watching the curve progression is far more valuable than the risk of the small amount of radiation that the patients receive. Um, okay, uh, thanks. So, uh, uh, going back to uh, Mark, um, we have several participants that are asking questions about um, uh, brand name facilities that offer uh, kind of multimodal. 
uh, scoliosis care, and I'm not going to say any of the uh, brand names on the webinar, um, but uh, uh, in general, I think that they use um, some versions of uh, scoliosis-specific uh, therapy exercises, uh, perhaps some sort of specialty bracing, as well as uh, lifestyle and nutritional counseling. Um, so, Mark, I guess we're wondering if you could make uh, a comment about uh, uh, any uh, evidence or support for these uh, kind of uh, branded operations. Um, you know, uh, the it really has arisen over the past two to three years that um, a lot of larger institutions will offer uh, multi, um, essentially directional mm -hmm. approaches to managing scoliosis, and the focus a lot is on non-operative management. Um, again, there is no good data suggesting a concerted effort like that actually improves your outcomes compared to the standard treatment. So um, we will wait for it. We will certainly are hopeful that it does, but there is no evidence currently. Okay, thanks. A, a lot of questions on uh, bracing. So uh, for, for Ryan, we have, we have some participants that um, have trouble wearing the brace, and we know that compliance uh, uh, is an issue for uh, many of our patients. So do you have uh, any suggestions about ways to make brace wear easier? That's a million dollar question. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, some people roll with it great and some really struggle. Um, most importantly is to make sure that number one that your the brace is fitted properly by an, uh, an orthotist uh, and that the orthotist is happy with the the way the brace is donned or put on and it's placed at the right tension uh, and the, that it's sitting in the right position. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, you also want your treating provider to uh, be happy with the way your brace is correcting or, or holding your spine while you're in the brace. Um, so if those are all okay, um, you know, obviously as I mentioned before, with a, if it's at the beginning portion of bracing, you know, have a brace wear schedule that starts slow and you add on to it and you ramp up eventually to your prescribed schedule. Um, make sure the brace isn't too tight. Um, obviously make sure if you're having trouble to, to look at the skin, make sure you're not getting any skin uh, sores. Um, wearing a t-shirt undergarments, usually a, a, just a light cotton shirt is the best. Some patients will try and get more like textile Under Armour shirts or whatever and they, they don't tend to work as well as just plain dry cotton. So altering that can be helpful. Um, I, you know, I'll oftentimes tell patients that you know if you you know giving them giving a break for a day for a sleepover or something is reasonable. I mean expecting it to be very regimented and every single night is probably not realistic. So um, you know and you know, if all else fails, go in and talk to your provider and say, hey, we're having trouble, what else can we do? And th those simple things can are, are usually enough to um, help weather the storm and get through the, the difficult times that usually will go away. Okay, great. We've got time for a couple more. Um, so, uh, Sanjeev, I think you mentioned this in your talk, but we have uh, some questions wanting to follow up on the natural history of smaller scoliosis. And so if patients end up with a curve, say, uh, you know, less than 40 degrees, what can they expect their natural history to be? Right, so the the biggest uh, uh, issue with that is the progression of the curve. So if you've had a curve that progressed very uh, slowly, then the natural pro progression of that curve is going to be fairly slow going forward. Um, and the long-term um, in numbers we sometimes use are a half degree progression or degree progression per year. So there, there, you may expect some progression over the course of your lifetime. And the biggest um, issue people have is with cosmetic concerns um, rather than any major uh, stomach problems, GI problems, or heart or lung problems. So um, later on in life people may have fewer concerns about how they appear, but especially in the teenage years that's a, that's a big concern. So um, at that at that stage, it's probably more simply a cosmetic thing than any sort of lifestyle thing. Okay, great. I uh, I think we'll uh, we'll end with uh, one more question about bracing. So um, we we have a lot of participants that are asking about the specific time period that braces have to be worn, and as we know, different providers will make different recommendations about the type of brace. 
um, and the amount that they'd like their patients to wear it. So I'd actually like to get a quick answer uh, from uh, each of our panelists about what their normal uh, or most common brace is and what their uh, most common prescription for brace wear is. So um, we start with Sanjeev on that and then we'll go to Ryan and Mark. Yeah, so I, um, I'll go with what Ryan said earlier. You know, I, uh, there are a lot of patients that come in asking for the, uh, the, the modern three-dimensional correction braces, but uh, typically the prescription is for a Boston brace, and uh, the recommendation is to use as many hours as you can. So typically I would recommend more than 16 hours a day. Uh, I do try and um, uh, recommend some uh, scoliosis-specific exercises with that as well as an adjunct. And it's just more about, uh, I'm in New York and a lot of people are into that, um, that sort of alternative therapies and, and treatments. So they want to be doing something and be hands-on and just not just be passive with their brace. So um, I, I have no problem with them doing yoga or Pilates in addition to the bracing, as long as they wear their 16 to 8 hours of, of brace a day. Yeah, my uh, prescription is probably very similar. Right? It's usually a, a Boston style brace uh, and I tell them to try and do it 16 to 18 hours a day. Uh, and if they get it, that's great. And if they're a little bit under that, they're still over the 13 hours a day that they need uh, for it to be effective. Once in a while, I'll switch to a Providence brace um, if there's difficulty with compliance or if the patient just has a, a thoracolumbar curve and they're really uh, they really want to use a Providence nighttime brace instead. So, but typically, uh, the, I think the evidence really points toward Boston bracing. And then I would echo uh, Sanjeev's comments on the uh, the. We have a Sroth therapist in town, so if patients are interested in using that, I will happily write them a prescription as long as they're wearing the brace as well. Same thing with other anything to keep themselves physically fit, uh, which most kids nowadays are into all kinds of things to keep them busy and stay active. So that's what I usually tell them. Mark, any comment about your usual brace prescription? Oh, um, my, uh, you know, um, over the years, I've realized that compliance with the Boston brace has been quite poor in my population. And um, at this point, I'm about 95% nighttime bracing uh, alone. And I found it's more tolerable for the patient. It's um, easier for the family. There just aren't as many arguments. Um, uh, so that becomes the kind of the... Uh, standard for me. I think um, with the heat sensors, uh, I think uh, we've realized that, you know, the, a bunch of people who are prescribed the Boston brace never quite reach the 13-hour threshold. The vast, uh, the, uh, on average, uh, probably half the patients will kind of be below that. So I think that it's kind of sobering data. Um, I, it is uh, probably about 5% of my population now use a Boston brace, and those are the, uh, the rare birds who are fantastically compliant. Okay, great. I'll, I'll throw my two cents in and say that I think that the best brace uh, for patients to use is one that they can be uh, compliant with. And uh, in general, the best studies we have show that uh, the more braces are worn, uh, the, the greater chance you have of preventing a scoliosis surgery. So my general recommendation is not a specific time period, but it is an as much as possible uh, recommendation. And uh, so with that, I... Uh, I think that's about all the time we have this evening. So I'd really like to thank um, all of our speakers for their efforts and their commitment to making this happen. So we, we couldn't do this at all if we didn't have very dedicated volunteers. And also a, uh, a big thank you to uh, 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 Jennifer Heller and uh, Kathy Blanke and the rest of our SRS staff uh, who did a wonderful job of managing these logistics uh, and to uh, Michelle Marks for helping me uh, organize the questions. So um, for all of our participants, I believe you should be receiving an emailed survey to help us assess the webinar and plan future webinars. So we would appreciate your feedback on that. Um, and as a final reminder, if you'd like to uh, revisit anything from the webinar or share it with others, um, uh, we plan to make it available shortly through a link on uh, srs.org. Um, so thank you all for participating. And uh, that concludes our uh, first patient education uh, webinar. Everyone have a great evening.